I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. lineup tonight we've got Andy McDonald trade unionist he's back on the show for about the tenth time also for the first time we've got free speech union director Jan McBarish political commentator Chloe Dobbs she's on the show for the second time we've got self-made millionaire successful businesswoman Kate Stewart and reggae star Levi Roos but first let's go to the news Good evening, I'm Sophia Wenslet in the GB Newsroom. First, some breaking news. US media is reporting that a man has set himself on fire outside the courthouse in New York, where former US President Donald Trump's hush money trial is underway. The person on fire received medical attention and was taken from the area. The circumstances of the fire was unclear. We will bring you more as we get it. The UK and Western allies are calling for de-escalation in the Middle East after reports that Israel launched airstrikes against Iran. State media says three drones were shot down with explosions heard at an airbase near the city of Isfahan. No damage or injuries have been reported in the latest exchange. The strike is thought to be in response to the last weekend's attack when Iran fired a barrage of drones and missiles at Israel. Scotland's former First Minister has spoken for the first time since her husband was charged by police. Nicola Sturgeon was questioned by journalists as she left her home in Glasgow. It's incredibly difficult, but, you know, that's not the main issue here, so um, I can't say any more. I'm not going to say any more. Um, Peter Murrell, who was the SNP's chief executive for more than two decades before standing down last year, has been charged in connection with the embezzlement of funds. Detectives are investigating how more than £600,000 in donations for independence campaigning was spent. The 59-year-old, who is no longer in custody, has also resigned his SNP membership. In other news, the Met Police has apologised after an officer used the term openly Jewish in an anti-Semitism campaigner who was near a pro-Palestine march. A video clip posted on social media showed the moment Gideon Falter was threatened with arrest by police. You are quite openly Jewish. This is a pro-Palestinian march. I'm not accusing you of anything, but I'm worried about the reaction to your presence. The chief executive of Campaign Against Anti-Semitism was wearing a keeper skull cap when he was stopped from crossing a road near the demonstration in London last Saturday. The Met Police Assistant Commissioner said the officer's poor choice of words was hugely regrettable. And five Just Stop Oil protesters have been convicted of aggravated trespass after they disrupted a performance of Les Miserables in London's West End last year. The performance was stopped when activists stormed the stage and locked themselves to the set. An audience of around 1,000 people was asked to leave the venue and the performance was cancelled. The court was told the action cost the theatre an estimated £60,000. And for the latest story, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Lee Anderson's Real World. Welcome to Lee Anderson's Real World, and today joining me is the director of the Free Speech Union, Jan McBarish. Thank you for coming on the show Thanks for the first me. time. And he's back, he's left in the corner, he's our socialist, it's Andy McDonald. He's a trade unionist by profession. Look, this week, guys, we saw the NatCon conference in Brussels, the sound of heavy jack boots outside, mm. the police storming in, and the mayor of Brussels cancelling the event. Is this a sign of things to come, Jan, if we get a Labour government? Well, it wasn't just one mayor, it was three who were involved, and there was 
two venues that cancelled and the third one held the line and refused to be cancelled despite political pressure behind the scenes. So I think it, it's really, really serious what's gone on there. And it was very disappointing to see, well, West Streeting, for example, in the House of Commons, not taking this seriously, well, yeah. treating it as a joke and as a way of having a dig at the other at the Tories, in particular Suella Braverman. But um, I think that, which could be an indication, yes, that um, we're in for a really rough ride when it comes to free speech, because if you don't actually understand the point of it uh, and the principles of it, then you really are not in a position to defend it. And there's some high-profile politicians there, like Nigel Farage, Suella Braverman was there, um, you know, trying to get their points across, talking about, um, you know, security and, and uh, in Europe and, and making our borders safer and stuff like that. And then, yet yeah, this mayor, three mayors, as, as Jen rightly says, tries to shut this event down. Is it a sign of things to come under a Labour government? I don't see how it would be a, a sign of things to come under a Labour government. None of the, the mayors are a member of the Labour Party, or at least the British Labour Party, so that doesn't really make sense. And, you know, uh, that point about West Street, I think he was more mocking the fact that a serving MP was going earning the big bucks in Brussels than serving a constituents. More, more than anything, I think it was a jibe about Miriam Cates and uh, Swella Braverman going and serving their own interests rather than, uh, you know, serving the constituents. And I think it is funny that Suella did go and talk about border security, considering the fact that she did fail in her role as Home Secretary to protect our borders. But, but that's besides the point. I think when, when we look at free speech, you know, the same people that are condemning the police trying to shut this uh, conference down, are the same people that were calling for the pro-ceasefire protest to be shut down because there were some fringe members who were extremists. I think it's the very same logic. But, Jan... Uh, we see this in, in Brussels, and I was quite staggered by it. Actually, it played into Nigel's hands, I think, a little bit, and, and Suella's hands. But we already see this in this country, I think, with some of our universities and our educational facilities where they, where they ban speakers. Well, I think, I mean, I, it's of a different order in Brussels because it was uh, the state ultimately got involved and the police were there to shut down the conference rather than protect it from the protesters. So the argument was made by one of the mayors uh, to the venues that security would be an issue. Uh, there wasn't time for a risk assessment yeah. and therefore the police um, uh, couldn't be expected to uh, to make sure that the conference could go ahead safely yeah. without being shut down by protesters. However... Over here, while we haven't seen a situation yet where the police actually raid an event and, uh, and shut it down, the silencing happens behind the scenes before it ever gets to the venue. So at the Free Speech Union, we had, and I organise events for the Free Speech Union, we have, a, a, in the last of four years, we have had so many instances of really very respectable uh, organisations and individuals who want to organise events and they just cannot even get past the first stage because the venue will be warned off or will be wary uh, even before anybody calls them. Yeah. But there are threats made. And also that, that establishes a kind of culture where people expect there to be trouble or expect to be having threatening calls to staff, for example. And yeah. that makes it very difficult for venues to say yes. And it isn't just higher education. It's, it's theatres. It's yeah. comedy clubs. Yeah. It's right the way across civic and cultural life. And, mm. um, you know, you don't even know about these. Well, not you, but we don't yep. even know because you'll never hear what doesn't get uh, aired in the first place. So it's, it's, it's very, very serious over here, but it's um, not reached the point yet yeah. where, where we've had the police actually shut so down. So let's go back to the left of the corner. Andy, let's just imagine that next year we have a, a NatCon conference in, for example, say, Birmingham. Um, and the, the mayor of the, uh, the Midlands, whoever it is, then decides to, to ban this conference. Uh, would you be in support of that? I, 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 that's a wild hypothetical you know uh, there was a natcon conference last year in london under a labor mayor that wasn't banned so i, I think if you track the logic of the okay, events that, happening in the uk there hasn't it, been a banning. you're sounding like a politician here andy let's well no it's it, just the truth isn't it a labor mayor did way. not ban the do event do you support the, the the mayor in brussels banning this conference uh I think it's it's his city. It's down to him to to decide what he wants in his city. It's not for me to decide. I'm not Jesus. I'm not from Brussels. No, but that's the voice of Labour. You see, Dan, this is a, a Labour supporter. I left in a corner. I think it is probably a sign of of things to come if Labour do get in power this year. But you know, this is a fundamental part of our society: is the ability to to say what you want. You're allowed to offend people. You're allowed to have demonstrations. You're allowed to protest. I mean, even the ones that come out here on Parliament Square on a Wednesday night, and, and you know, some of it's I don't agree with. We've seen from the rivers to the sea, um, shown on Big Ben on uh, just a few weeks back. But you know, they, the people that do come out have that right to protest. And when the states start getting involved, Jan, it sort of it gets rid. It, it chips away at democracy. 
Oh, absolutely. But and also it's so it's the use of the law uh, as it was attempted in this case in Brussels. So that, that's heavy. You know, if you actually get a legal order, which has to be enforced by the local police, uh, to uh, to shut down an event, that's that's very very serious. And you know, if you're from the left, then you know people on the left are flagging up this week that uh, an event in Berlin was actually raided by the police, yeah. which is a pro-Palestinian event, uh, and that was shut down on hate hate speech uh, grounds. Yeah. So, you know, it's really important that everybody's consistent on this. Yep. And uh, over here, obviously, those are beyond our, uh, necessarily beyond our uh, jurisdiction, our concern. But it's really, really important that we don't just simply make this a left-right issue. Because if you if they come for you, they will come for the other side. Yeah. It's just inevitable. That's what happens. You've, legit you've legitimated yep. the shutting down of, of, of speech, which is well within the bounds of democracy. It's well within that. And that's you know, if we're going to have a, a democratic culture, free speech has got to be fundamental to that. And, you know, whether you're a Labour voter or whatever, you need to hold to account your politicians and your political yeah. leaders on yeah. free speech and democratic grounds. It's not just simply a left-right issue. And the right also have to do that. I have to tr properly understand yeah. the importance of free speech. So, Andy, surprisingly enough, I agree with pretty much everything Jan has to say. That is a shock, I know that. But this is a slippery slope. This is a path towards communism, surely. How is it a path towards communism? Like? Surely you don't know that. You don't know what communism is. Communism I do is when know the what state communism controls what people think. Well, no, that's authoritarianism. Do. That's not yeah. just communism. Okay. So, so is it a slippery slope? You, know, you, you can have authoritarians on the right and the left. Well, you can be so. as intellectual as you want, Andy, but this is. Well, it's not very intellectual. You just said something that was incorrect. He's, he's right. He's yeah. right, isn't he? It's We've had dictators on the left and the right. We have. We and have. You can't communist. get too cosy about it. No, no, We have to be alert. Yeah, we have. It is a slippery slope, surely, Andy. I don't think it's a slippery slope into communism at all. From what I understand, the Brussels mayor is a centre-left mayor. He's not particularly hard left. He's just a, a democratic socialist yeah. like a lot of the Labour Party are. Uh, you know, the NatCon conference happened in London, like I said, under a, uh, under a Labour mayor. He didn't ban it, he didn't raid it. I don't think it's a sign for the Labour Party are going to slip and become a communist state. I, I don't think that's true. I think that's just being a, you're being a but bit you're reactive. Not, are you not concerned at all, Andy, uh, this, uh, of this sort of action? Where of the Labour down... Party slipping into a communist state? No, 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 shutting down free speech. Shutting down free speech. Well, you, you know, I sat across that table from you uh, yeah. not a month ago, and you were calling for the pal all the Palestinian protests to be shut down. No, I wasn't. So, yeah, you were. I, no, I remember no, it. You know, we, we not, can not run all the clip, of them, but, not um, all of them. We can run the clip, but yeah. you, you were calling for them, the police to intervene. I was calling uh, I, I for you know, you've people. Got to, you've got to Get the Come on, let's get it right. Let's get it right. You're being a little bit dishonest in the oh, debate no. again. What I was calling for was the people who were shining the, the murderous graphics on, on the Elizabeth Tower to be arrested. That's sure. what I was calling for. Nothing wrong with people peacefully protesting, but when they're inciting hatred and the murder of a race of people, I think they should be arrested. Do you? Yeah. There you go. Jam. My logic tracks. <laughs> you know, yours doesn't. It wasn't just the the graphic shown on Big Ben. You were also going on a wider sense of. No, it wasn't. Uh, that, that's to, a the logic does need to That's track a different league. debate, Andy. When people go out there dressed as terrorists, and you've got children dressed as terrorists, police having their photographs taken with children dressed as terrorists, they're shining graphics onto well, Elizabeth police Tower. Police were taking photos. No, they were. They were. They were it was widely distributed on social media. That you've, was got in these, you've got these. You've got these. You've got these extremists. Uh, shining onto Big Ben from the river to the sea, that means the elimination of a, a complete race of people. I think they should be arrested. I think they should be carted off and locked up. I could go on about this all night, Or Jan. maybe a trial first. Yeah, a trial, that would be fair, wouldn't it? Well, it would be fair. It's well, it really would important. be fair, Jan. Come on, if you're going to hold up a democracy, then you need well, to be Well, it would be fair, Jan, if the police actually did the job in the first place and actually arrested I agree, these and, uh, you know, we've not. had these instances yeah. where instead they've been arresting a, 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 an Iranian dissident yeah. who has holds a sign which yeah. says, yeah. state the law, yeah. Hamas is terrible. Uh, enough of that, we're going to roll up now. And coming up next on the show, we're going back in the day with Levi Roots. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Martin Daubney, weekdays from 3 p.m. SUV drivers in Oxford will face higher parking charges, proposals tabled by the local Green Party or passed by the City Council. The motion argues that heavier cars like SUVs cause more damage to roads, are more likely to seriously injure or kill pedestrians and cause more illnesses due to pollution. However, the Alliance of British Drivers has condemned the plan as absolutely outrageous. 
Well, let's get the thoughts now of the legendary motoring journalist, Quentin Wilson. Quentin, welcome to the show. Always a pleasure. We hear a lot about the war on motorists, this time targeting SUVs because of their weight and the charges could be astronomical. This idea first started in Paris, now it's coming to Oxford. Can you tell us a bit about how it would work? OK, so the idea is that the, the, the charges will penalise people who drive heavier SUVs and I guess by implication electric cars, although Oxford Council haven't said exactly what they're going to do with, with EVs. But this is all based around this notion of, of, of SUVs being heavier than passenger cars, therefore wearing out the roads more. Now, there was a study, I've got it here in front of me, from the University of Edinburgh in 2022 that said... Um, Real-world tests found that overwhelmingly the wear is caused by large vehicles, buses, heavy good vehicles. Road wear from cars and motorcycles is so low that this is immaterial. Now, obviously, driving around a medieval city like Oxford in an SUV isn't the brightest thing in the world to do. But the idea that we should penalise the owners of these cars based on imperfect science that's been read on social media, I think is completely wrong. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Neil Oliver, every Sunday night at 6pm on GB News. And if an hour is not nearly enough for you, go to gbnews.com for special extended episodes online every Friday at 9pm, where we can truly get into the nitty gritty of what's going on. GB News, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Welcome back to Lee Anderson's Real World. We're going back in the day now with Levi Roots. Thanks, Levi, yeah, for going cheers, on here. Nice, uh, nice listen, to you. Um, I've sort of seen this script before. You was... Uh, he was born in Jamaica. Yes, Clarendon. And you came here when you was 11 years old. Yeah. A few years ago, let's be yes, honest. Yeah, quite a few. Um, when you came here, what was your first impressions of this of this country? Well, nobody had prepared me. I suppose it was the days of the Windrush generation. Yeah. When people were coming over with this sort of help after the war efforts. And yeah. my parents was part of the Windrush generation. But nobody had prepared the kids. I was 10 at the time, just before I came. Wow. And um, nobody had prepared me for the cold, for instance. And that's, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> snow is not in Jamaica. And as a 10-year-old boy, yeah. running around, having like, you know, a three-mile radius of, my, of a yeah. garden. Yeah. And my beautiful grandma looking after me. And then all of a sudden, I had landed here and then you know you had to face the things like racism and skinheads yeah. and everything yeah. chasing you know, want to rip your head off and all this kind yeah. of stuff it was quite frightening at okay. first but um i my, this good thing that my family was here for quite some years before yeah. so it kind of prepared me for when i so we had wilfred emmanuel jones on the yes, show good last old week. Wilfred. and the one thing that he spoke about is these people coming from jamaica back in the 50s and 60s yes. uh, and 70s they were actually pioneers they were brave people they came for a fresh start and really quite brave to, to make that move yeah. halfway around the world. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose that, you know, it was the start of that joining of, of people from the Caribbean and from other yeah. worlds coming to the UK. Because um, my parents was part of that. My mom came, she worked in the NHS. Yeah. She was a lab technician at King's wow. College Hospital for many, many years. Yeah. My father worked in the, in the, in the, the, yeah. the local yeah. council. Yeah. So it was really people were coming over and discovering themselves, but also that joining between black and white people. And then, of course, food and music became that reason. Ah, well, this is what I'm going to get together. on to now is because I've had three Jamaicans on this show over the past year, and everyone's been brilliant at cooking. Why yeah. is that? Well, I, I suppose, especially for young kids, you know, I, I think everybody knows that me and my cooking experiences yeah. came from my grandma. Yeah. It was one way that the grandmothers who was looking after the kids while the mom and dads came to the UK was okay. try to keep that family together yeah. and our food was an important structure. And it was for when, the, when you know, Windrush generation came over. They used food and music. Of course, remember the times of ska music and everything was coming from the Caribbean coming over here. Yeah. So music and food was an important 
important tool for that integration yeah. between black and white people here in the So moves it come forward. You, yeah. speak, you, you speak in my language, yeah, Levi. Uh, so you know a little bit about music and reggae. I do, yeah. You uh, used to play football with the late, great Bob Marley. Absolutely, and I, I love talking about that, well, obviously. No, yeah, no, it was great. You know, Bob was at the time was in exile here. He had just been shot in Jamaica, so he came over here. And to record some of his iconic songs that he did. And he lived over in, Bat in, in Chelsea. Yeah. And me and my band and the Sir Cox and Sound System, we lived in Wandsworth. So it was a meeting of Bob Marley and the Whalers and Levi Roots and Cox and Sound in Battersea Park every weekend to have a lovely kick around. And it was some of the most inspirational you know, times of my life. The man was an absolutely fantastic footballer. Bit of a sort of Maradona-esque type of a player, short, um, being able to hold on to the ball. And dare I say, if he wasn't a musician, I think he would have been a great footballer. Wow. Um, so you was raised as a Christian. Yes. And now you're, you've converted to Rastafaria. Yes, you know, yes For the yes. more ignorant amongst us, what is that? Well, Rastafaria was a way, at my, I think it was started by Marcus Garvey, and Marcus Garvey is Jamaica's premier national hero. Yeah. And he was the one that was saying to, you know, we had all these pictures of the white Jesus with the blue eyed on, the, on black people's wall. Yeah. And Marcus Garvey was one of the guys that came around and says, look, look to Africa for someone that you can find an yeah, inspiration yeah. for. And it was the time when Emperor Ali Selassie was being crowned king. Yeah. And he was saying that if you want somebody to be inspired by, yeah. look for this great, you know, black king who was just about to become an emperor. Yeah. And with him, you can find some inspiration. Mm -hmm. And I suppose a lot of people who was in Jamaica and disenfranchised at the time that couldn't work with the you know white blue eyed Jesus. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. thought that well we'll choose him as somebody to inspire us. And that's how the whole Rastafari culture started. And of yeah. course when I was in school I remembered and I found out that my real name is Keith Valentine Graham. Not and Levi I, then. Not Levi not and Levi. I used to look up Keith Graham and I just found out that it was a Scottish name. <laughs> I kept looking in the mirror and thinking I don't look bloody Scottish. Yeah, you, Something is happening. You get yet. that though because yeah. I, I had a friend many years ago, I've not seen him for donkey's years. Um, he was he was from Jamaica, and his, his name was Winston. And, yes. And a lot of uh, families in Jamaica at the time we would call the kids Winston. Yeah, and absolutely. And, 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 and we had these names that we didn't identify with. Yeah. And I suppose when the Rastafari culture came along, it just taught you that maybe you're not Scottish after all. Find who you are. And it was through the Rastafari culture that I found that maybe I'm not Scottish yeah. after all. So I found Levi and called myself Levi Roots. And of course, Levi is a biblical name from the sort of Jewish religion. You don't fancy yeah. presenting as a Scotch member of the Kilt, on yeah. that. Okay. Well, actually, uh, I did went to Scotland to find the Grahams, which was my, my name and yeah, fun. Yeah. They were bloodthirsty lot, those <laughs> Grahams. <laughs> now, we're talking about food um, and this, this cultural thing you've got going up in Jamaica where you can make the most amazing meals from... From nothing, the basically. Nothing, yeah, absolutely. And surely there's lessons to be learned in this country. When we, I know you're involved in, in certain charities, Trust or Trust, etc., uh, with food poverty, but surely there are lessons people can learn in this country from countries like... Like Jamaica now to to make their money go further with with the basic yeah, ingredients. Yeah, absolutely, and it's what, what my grandma was good at. And I suppose when I discovered you know the the sauce at the end, you know at, at my in my lifetime. Uh, when you're talking it, about sauce, yes, Levi, are we yeah, talking about, talk about that? Like yeah. a, about sauce like this? We are, which we is are, your sauce, really, absolutely. And it, I think my grandma had a way of creating something out of nothing. Yeah. And sauces was a great thing that you could okay. just do basic thing like potatoes, but yeah. you had a little bit of sauce yeah, on it, and did, then it yeah. becomes like yeah. a Sunday meal with everything. Thing I've like just that. got to say, though, Levi, looking at the camera there, there, there are other, according to my producer, Greg here, there are other sources available online and in supermarkets. That's just to give them a fair yeah. point. I will be trying that later. But yes. you're right, I know some of these poorer countries make the most basic meals yeah. taste nice, don't yeah. they? Yeah, absolutely. It is about flavours. It's about yeah. creating flavours. And I suppose when you didn't have money in those days, yeah. you just needed something a little bit more than the bland food. Because yeah. we had all the potatoes and the bananas and everything, but yeah. once you had a bit of sauce in there, it was just like having a Sunday meal with all the flavours included yeah. in that. So you've done, you brought over um, music from yeah. Jamaica. That's great, some great music. And you brought over the, um, the food, some yeah. great food. You talked about the racism when you came over. Yeah. That must have been difficult as a young man. I can't actually understand how that would be for you. How did you cope with that? Anyway? Well, you know, I, I, I feel it more for my parents who had come before, who came to that, you know, that time when it was yeah. no dogs, no blacks, no Irish. Yeah. And again, no one had prepared them for that because yeah. everybody had seen this letter from yeah. the Queen saying, come to England because these jobs help us to fix, fix the country after the war. Yeah. But for them coming over, it was really a hard time for them. Yeah. And I suppose when we came over as kids, for us to face, you know, you turn left on one stage and everybody loves you, all these white kids, 
want to know about scar music yeah, and yeah, the food yeah, and everything. Yeah. But you turn right and yeah. the skinheads want to rip your head off. And I suppose it was that kind of, you know, environment I came yeah. into. And you had to learn to fight, yeah, basically yeah. to survive. And I suppose that kept me down for a long time, that fighting attitude. Yeah. And it wasn't until later on in my life that I found out I didn't need to fight yeah. because I had my grandma's recipes to yeah, turn you got to. Your food and, and your music, and, you? Absolutely. And that's yeah. how I actually eventually right, let's try this. Through. Let's do it. Now, I know if you poison me, um, I am insured, I've been told, by GB News. Yes, yeah. Do I, I'm going to try a bit. It, and you, yeah, go on, tell, tell me if it's and, too and spicy. It's barbecue sauce. So this would go with, what, chicken? Almost pork? anything. Almost anything at all. It's got a kick to it. It has. Like it's like you're a, turning red slightly. It's, it's, it's a cheeky little number. <laughs> 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 I do recommend yeah. that on um, probably on some chicken. Hold on a minute. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's very good. That's, yeah. that's excellent. Uh, oh, that's splendid. Thank you. Lee. Coming up next is uh, right versus left with Chloe Dobbs and trade unionist Andy McDonald. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it is nice though. Yeah, 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 <laughs> Give me some yogurt. Yeah. <laughs> Hi there and welcome to the latest update from the Met Office for GB News. Sky is clearing overnight, most places fine as we start the weekend with high pressure in charge. That high pressure moving in from the west. Still a bit of a chilly breeze from the north, but as high pressure moves in, skies are going to clear, winds are going to ease and under lengthy clear skies and with light winds, temperatures will fall away. A few mist and fog patches possible for the likes of Northern Ireland and some frosty conditions as we begin the weekend. So gardeners beware. Temperatures in urban areas 3 to 5 Celsius but as low as minus 3 for the likes of Northern Ireland, North West England and North Wales. Temperatures though through Saturday morning will quickly rise because of the widespread sunny skies and it stays sunny towards the south and the west for much of the afternoon. However, it tends to turn cloudier further north with some outbreaks of light rain moving into northern Scotland where it will be fairly chilly and we've still got that breeze down the North Sea coast making it feel on the cool side. Warm in the sunshine elsewhere and another sunny day to come for Northern Ireland, parts of southwest Scotland, West Wales and southwest England on Sunday. Bright skies also into the southeast. Elsewhere, increasingly low cloud and some patchy rain and drizzle for Northern England and eastern Scotland. Monday brings further cloudy skies for many with some patchy rain, but it stays relatively cool. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria De Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made well, my I'm argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing up and down the country that was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Joining me now for right versus left is trade unionist and socialist and other things, Andy McDonald, and back on the show for the second time, political commentator Chloe Dobbs. Thanks, guys. Look, we've seen a judgment this week in the courts where they upheld a decision by, by Catherine Babel Singh, I think it's her school, the Michaela Community School, I think it's called, where they um, had to fight a, a quite um, ferocious court case to uphold this decision to keep a ban in place 
on prayer. I think it was a, a, a young Muslim lady that took the school to court. £150,000 in taxpayers' money. Was the court right, Andy? I, I don't think so. I, I think it's it's a bizarre principle to chase after. You know, uh, a uh, you know, a classroom at lunchtime is not that much to ask for. You know, a child to go and pray. It, it just makes them happy. I, I don't see why. You know, Catherine has decided to die on this hill. She talks about it being a secular school, then pushes "God save the king" down your throat. You know, that's not that's not very secular of her. I, I think the logic is completely just bizarre from her. She preaches that you know we have Christian values, we have yeah. Christian values, we're a Christian country, but no, we're a secular school, so we can't have any praying. Okay, it just doesn't track for me. Chloe, would you like to come back on this out-of-touch socialist? Uh, yes, I definitely yeah. would. So I think it's really important to understand the context of this case. And I think Catherine herself is not advocating that you have a prayer ban in every single school. Um, in this case, you had a situation which was really spiralling out of control quite quickly. So first of all, the school is just not practical for them to have a prayer room. They don't have enough rooms. I mean, if, Andy, if you want to pay for them to have a load of prayer rooms added on, you know, go for it. Um, mm -hmm. This is a school which is now around sort of 50% Muslim pupils. So they would probably need uh, multiple prayer rooms, which is one thing that the head teacher said. So what happened is you didn't have any kids praying at the school before. And then suddenly one student decided to start praying in the playground. And then it sort of became a trend and they all started following. And then you had, men because the playground members of the public can see, you had members of the public getting involved, signing this petition, sending threats toward teachers. And this all started spiraling out of control. You had bomb threats, you had, um, homes of the teachers being uh, the com people coming there to attack them something had to be done you also had um you know this is a school with lots of different faiths and they've had they're very clear with the parents you need to make compromises so we can all yeah, get along yeah. but you then had for example you have some muslim kids who want to fast during ramadan and others which don't and you had the kids which yeah. are fasting mm -hmm. bullying the other kids trying to stop them eating their food trying to um impose their rules on on others and so something clearly needed to be done um, to, to cap this. Um, and so I think the prayer ban on, on practicality here made sense. Now, it's not just Muslims in the school that have to make compromises. Uh, first of all, the head teacher meets every single parent before they come in yep. and is very, very clear, this is what you're signing up for. There's no prayer room here. You have to make compromises. She has had complaints from Christians about there being yeah, revision yeah, sessions yeah. on Sundays, but she said, you have to make a compromise. She's had complaints from Hindus about yep. there being eggs in the kitchen that potentially touch the plate. But she said, nope, if you want to come to this school, you have to compromise so we can all get along. So it's not like this is an anti-Muslim and she's been very, okay. Very clear okay, about Andy, that. I mean, Chloe's making a, a reasonable argument here. The, these parents know the rules when they send their kids to the school. Should they stick to the rules? I mean, I mean you know, clearly, you know, the the str Britain's strictest head teacher is what she likes to call herself. If kids are bullying each other at their school, it's not very strict, is it? You know, she's, she's well, clearly not that great. She's doing something about it. Well, no, and she's saying, action. oh, well, you it's know, not it's like no, if, if it's no problem is court. ever going to crop up at a school where you've got misbehaviour, even sure. if they're strict. Is how you respond to that. Yeah. Sure. She's so you very... just take kids to court. Like, but she, but Andy, should no, the children? Children, but She's it's dictating to the headmistress and the management of school how they run their school. Well, I, I think it, it's just bizarre, really. Like, you know, if a kid wants to pray, let them pray. Like, it, it's not that deep. Just but this give was them, causing give them absolute chaos give them with the members of the time. public seeing Give them a classroom at lunchtime, then. You don't need a dedicated prayer space. Just give them a classroom. It's just a bit of respect from her. She, she preaches, you know, British values. Respect is one of those values. I, I just don't understand why she... She won't do it. You know, Michaela Community School has a range of other problems that I think she needs to deal with first. Mm. I think this is a very bizarre hill to die on. Just give them a classroom. It's not that hard. I, I mean, I don't know exactly the dynamic at the school, but she's been very clear they don't have space for a prayer room. Now, this is a very high-performing school, very strict school. I would imagine they have a lot of revision, revision sessions going on at lunchtime. Well, no, they all sit together at lunchtime. They all sit together at lunchtime. All the years sit together. So, no, they don't. Where? What, well, in the lunch hall? Yeah, in the lunch hall, they don't have any lunchtime revision sessions. That's one of their policies to uh, increase cohesion between the year groups. OK, so, so, I mean, so I mean, maybe that's possible, but I do see this being a slippery slope to it spiralling out of control. So, so, for example, if you've then got kids saying, I need to pray at this time, so I'm going to walk out the classroom whilst yeah. the teacher is trying to deliver a lesson um, to go and pray, and then that teacher feels the need to, say, either catch up those kids and work overtime uh, because kids have walked out the classroom, mm. um, or have their students failing, which, you know, they want they're trying at the school that's trying to get amazing results. There's an important thing here, Andy, spiraling. for me. When I was at school back in the day, before you were born, um, school was one of the you know, one of the times where you felt 
equal with your, with, with your peers. Mm. You went to school, you did the same lessons, you played at the same time. If you did any praying, it was normally in the, in, the, in the morning, in the assembly time, you sang a few hymns and stuff like that. We're all together. This, I mean, we've got different faiths in school now. And I would imagine that, you know, when these children go home, life is a little bit different to being at school. But school should be a place where you come together and actually just go and learn how to read and write and, and develop yourself rather than getting brought in these, these bitter disputes. Sure, I agree. I, that's why I, I don't know why she's you know, putting so much resistance on just offering a classroom. It's not a slippery slope. But it's divisive. It's divisive. It's, well, it's, 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 people it's praying. divisive. How's School it divisive? is not a place of worship, right? Then why does she have them sing God Save the King every morning? That's objectively well, worshipful. God Save I, the King. You're I, asking I, God to do something. I, 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 would, I, would dis I would disagree with that. I would say that is slightly hypocritical. I don't think that that is necessary. I think if you go to a school which is a Christian school, like my sixth form was Methodist, and we had chapel for 20 minutes on a Thursday. I'm not religious, but I was like, OK, sure, I've signed up to go to this school, fine. But in that case, you know, fine, I, I will disagree with that. But nevertheless, I think the prayer ban makes sense. Also, I do think that this is potentially the case of um, a salty uh, student, because apparently um, the girl who has brought this case is a girl who was expelled. Um, well, they do throw out quite a lot of children that don't perform to their academic standards. So, well, you know, exactly. We, we but, do but, wonder how they get, you how they get their you, academic grades so high. You, you, know, they you, do... you, you would be angry and salty and wanting revenge. Well, there, have been, some very, there have been some very serious allegations of them having a mass offer-holding effort at Michaela Community School to maintain that they're high standards. So it wouldn't surprise me if there's a lot of students who feel pretty hard done by by the fact that you know a lot of them have alleged that they were illegally offer-holed. So you know, if I was you illegally, illegally offer-holed, it's when the schools remove a child from their role for academic or send purpose. You know, there have been some pretty pretty firm allegations about Michaela Community School. I think, you know, Catherine Barbell saying instead of going around the media dancing, she should go and deal with that issue before. OK, before. OK, guys, look, £150,000 to fight this court case. That's taxpayers' money, Chloe. Mm. Should this family now, who's, who's took this case to court, be made to pay that money back to the state? I think that's a difficult one yeah. because... On the one hand, I don't agree with uh, this, this pupil bringing the case, but also you don't want to live in a world where if you do need legal help and you do feel like you have, you have a legal case that needs to be brought, that if you're not rich and you can't afford crazy legal fees, um, that there's nothing that can be done. Yeah. So I, I, think that's, I think that's difficult. It is a lot of money, and I think that that is a waste of money yeah. to some degree, but I do think that we shouldn't... I don't think we should abolish legal aid. Yeah, I think that money, though, um, Andy, would have been better spent on the pupils at that school, helping them with their education, don't you think? Yeah, I'm sure, you know, 150 grand, that's almost two years of your MP salary, isn't it, Lee? So, you know, we could have got you for another two years for that. But, um, uh, I mean... It's you know, also it's almost same... two years' income tax I pay, Andy. Which I'm is sure it is. Yeah, you know, yeah, I'm yeah, sure yeah. with, what is it, is it the 50 or 100 grand you get from GB News yeah. plus your MP salary? And, you know, it, it gets a bit well, fuzzy. Well, once you grow up it one day, you might earn that It does get a bit fuzzy, Lee, with all your salaries. But the point being, you know, we shouldn't abolish legal aid. If you lose a case, we shouldn't set a precedent that you have to give the money back. I think, you know, that is a slippery slope there mm. where people who are genuinely let me put this question to you like none of you've got children right and i suppose one day Luckily you'll enough. have children unfortunately Andrew, you're going to find somebody you settle down with and you're going to have children and you've got two scores there one's a strict school run by catherine burble singh where you have to turn up on time you have to wear uniforms you have to call teachers miss and sir there is strict discipline and you have to do your homework and blah 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 then you've got another school, like one in, in, uh, in my community, well, it was back in the day, where you can call the teachers by their first names. There's no detention, there's no discipline, there's no uniform. You turn up when you want. You can go and have a crafty fag behind the, the bike shed when you, want, when you want. Which school would you send your children to? I think it depends on how my child is at the point when they're about to go to school. Yeah. So my upbringing, I hate authority. I, I, my parents were completely really? hands off. My parents were completely hands off. So when a teacher tells me what to do and says, you can't do this, you can't do that, I'm like, bugger off, because I'm just so not used yeah. to that. And my, for me, my parents leaving it up to me to decide the rule for myself made me made me much more mature, I think. But then there are other kids where I can see they really need some discipline. Yeah. So. If my kid clearly seems like, you know, they're going to go on and they're going to do their homework without even being told and without yeah. the threat of detention, then they can go to the more uh, libertarian school, as we might say. Okay, Whereas if my school, kid's Andy, not performing, they're libertarian school for your children. Either I want them to learn a trade, learn a proper skill. I think we need an a, a genuine alternative yeah. for people who are non-academic, yeah. honestly. I'd prefer them uh, to yeah, do that. OK, guys, right, we're going to go straight to the yes-no quiz. You know the rules to this, Andy, don't you? Yes. He does. Do you know the rules to this? I do. You've done this, haven't you? Yeah. See, that's an incorrect answer straight away. Oh. Yes <laughs> or no. Right, OK, Andy, to you. Was the Mayor of Brussels right to ban the NatCon conference? Yes. No. Chloe, is net zero a waste of money? Yes. 
No. No. Uh, Andy, should uh, the government be allowed to ban smoking? No. No. Wow, agreement. Um, Chloe, should the ULS expansion scheme in London be scrapped? Yes. Andy? Yes. Wow. And will Trump win the next US election, Andy? Yes. Yes. Should we do a tiebreaker? Yes. Yes. Oh, I can't even get you on that one, can I? No, you want to go back on one, Andy? Yeah, I think the, the Trump one is, is really quite interesting. Yeah. You know, I, I'm obviously not a supporter of Trump, but really? I'm also not really a supporter of Biden. Yeah. I, th I think he, he's a bit of a... Is he well? Well, that's the big question, isn't it? No one really knows. He's a bit dodgery and he, yeah. he's a bit odd. I think they just need to scrap him, get Gavin Newsom in the... Uh, Governor of California, Democratic Governor of California. Because he's made a right good job of California. Yeah, you know, he's, yeah. he's uh, you yeah, know, yeah, the yeah. thriving economy. You know, you yeah, look at Silicon yeah. Valley. That is zombies walking well, around. Silicon Valley is the top economy yeah, in the world. Threatening to I mean, take away. Uh, you know, Silicon Valley is objectively the greatest economy to, in the world. Threatening to take the away custody of, of um, uh, parents' custody over their children if they don't affirm their gender. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I, th I think you know, if you look yeah. at California, you've got Silicon Valley, you've got San Francisco. The Bay Area is the most. You know, it's one of the top economies in the world. Yeah, 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 like, yeah, let's yeah. be honest here. Well, it's yeah. better than Biden. Yeah, OK. And you think the smell of weed's bad in, in, in my neck of the woods? Get yourself there. <laughs> Chloe, do you want to come back on one? I mean, I'll respond to that firstly. Yeah, go on, I, I, I mean, nonsense, the it? streets of San Francisco, you've got these people walking around like, well, yeah. not even, just like zombies, yeah. um, all over the streets. Uh, crime is just absolutely spiralling out of control. All of the shops are having to... Uh, close and leave yep. the high street because yep. the theft is so bad. Yeah. Uh, you can steal up to, I think it's $950 worth of stuff, yep. stuff and the cops won't even yeah. turn up, so yeah. people are just going and stealing stuff. Is, is this a good it's thing, It's absolutely Andy, feral. I don't want what, to just live there. What, Gavin Newsom? Feral. It is absolutely well, I'm, feral. I'm not promoting feral behaviour. I just think Gavin Newsom is well, that's a pretty good leader in, uh, from an economic he perspective. Is he's, been a, he's been a thriving... No, he, he hasn't. This is happening, Andy, under his watch. And, and Chloe's right. You know, we, we did a, a drugs inquiry at, at that place over there on the Home Affairs Select Committee. And I think we spoke briefly about California, the problem we've got mm. with weed, and how it's turned some parts of the state in, into, into zombie states. You're right, Chloe. People are walking around like in a trance. I mean, that's yeah, the way. And I, mean. I don't want that to come here. It's absolutely well, horrifying. It is here. It is here. You know, you look well, at well, Mansfield, to, you look not, at Ashfield, conservative, conservative run Mansfield, Reform UK led Ashfield. There are crackheads all over. I think you know, and what are you doing about that? I think you've been smoking some what, stuff what, before you come on this show. What, what are you doing about that, Lee? You know, there's crackheads running all over Mansfield. So, what are you doing about it? Crackheads. There's always been crackheads. I mean, the crackheads started, if you want to call them that name, uh, sure. they started back in the 80s. Great. Who was in control in Ashford and Mansfield in the 1980s? Oh, that's a fantastic question. It was, well, it was, it was not, your not, party, wasn't it, at the time? It's a not difficult It was the Labour Party, it's of, a Labour party. Of whom you supported the at the time, socialists didn't you? were didn't in you charge. Think? I've seen the light, Andy. And you support them in the 80s? One day, when you grow up a little bit, you will probably see the light. Oh, I doubt it. Chloe's above her years. She's seen the light already. <laughs> OK, coming up next, we've got self-made millionaire Katie Stewart. Monday to Thursday from 7 p.m. There is a, a, a kind of a Mediterranean side to that as well, because my mother came from that side, you know, a, a big family. And I think there is that sense of community where family is kind of key. And I think that's really kind of what we sort of try and continue, really. I mean, certainly with children and stuff like that, you know, the Sunday lunches were always, you know, the big thing. Yeah, <laughs> really. if you go down the old camp road today. Very different. Very different, yeah. And that was quite some time ago as well, because we were very close to where the Tom Beckett was. Yeah, I know. There. I know, the and, boxing um, upstairs and all yeah, the rest of it. Yep, 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 yep. And, um, and I did go down there not so long ago, actually, and it really is very, very different. I mean, I'm not saying that's necessarily bad. I think we have a different view of things. In that Most sense. people in London, Nicky, don't even know the names of the next-door neighbours. No, true. We've that's completely true. lost that sense of community that you grew up with, yeah. that you knew. I think it's a real problem. Yeah, I mean, I have to say sometimes I'm a bit guilty of it where I am now as well. You live in big houses, and yeah, I yeah. do see my neighbours, but, you know, it's not quite the same as it was back. Now, I guess from that background, you're a teenager, you want to become a hairdresser. Yeah, that's, That must that, have been that, quite a difficult call. Yeah, that one was a really good, a really good call. My dad went, oh, God, what? I mean, it was just very funny. And, and certainly from the point of view of, you know, this was the early 70s. And yeah. So it wasn't really the kind of the choice of most, that most people would do. No, but you did. But why? I don't know, actually. I mean, actually, I went to a grammar school and um, I didn't do as well in the final um, uh, exams. And I was kind of forced into sort of leaving. And you suddenly go, ooh, 
no idea what to do here, really. Yeah. But the idea of doing something in fashion. And, you know, I really kind of... I, I know that I was given some really good advice, actually, by somebody that said, just start at the bottom. Don't necessarily go to, you know, college or whatever. Not, there may not be anything wrong with those, but just start at the bottom. Go to the best place you can and start sweeping the floor. We're GB News, and we come from a proud tradition of British journalism. That's why I'm so excited to be here. It's something so new. The first news channel to be launched in Britain in over 30 years. Launched to represent the views of the British people. To go where other broadcasters refuse to go. How did you find out about the story in the first place? Launched with one aim. To be the fearless champion of Britain. It's an absolutely fantastic atmosphere here. This is GB News. The People's Channel. GB News, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Lee Anderson's Real World. It's time for Last Orders with Kate Stewart. Welcome to the show, Kate. You've had a, um, a different start in life to most successful businesswomen. A self-made millionaire by the age of, what, 24, 25? 26. 26, sorry about that, getting my figures wrong. Uh, but you took a, um, a different approach. It's not... Um, you um, sort of concentrated on earning money while still at school, working on Matthew Street and uh, getting a few quid in your pocket, flipping burgers, I think, when working for £2.50 an hour when you left school. What sort of motivated you as that, as that young person in Liverpool to, you know, to earn all this money? Coming from a deprived background, coming from a council estate, not much money being round, and my family not being able to afford not being able to afford to give me the stuff that I wanted. Okay. And I always had a great work ethic. I always wanted to get out there, earn money and work. So, yeah, I had a very colourful background. I was flipping burgers on Matthew Street till, like, 4am in the morning, and then I'd get up and go to school. I just didn't respond to the education system. I was disruptive. I was bored. So, in the end, they threw me out. Um, went on to work in a sports shop and got pregnant at 17. OK. So I was a single parent at the age of 17, and at that point, everyone had wrote me off. So it's, oh, you know, she's never going to make anything of herself. She's never going to do anything. And that gave me the drive and determination to prove everybody wrong. Oh, good. So single parent at 17, not much of an education, but great work ethic. Yeah. Um, was it a little bit scary for you as well, though, Kate, being, you know, pregnant, um, having a baby at that age? Absolutely petrifying, but I am, I am a confident person as well. Um, and I don't really give a damn what anyone thinks of me. And I'm very resilient as well, so I'll always get up and try. And sometimes I'll fall over, yeah. but I jump straight back up, dust myself off, and I go again. So you've got all this motivation as a young person, um, wagging school, as we say, and working and being a nuisance at school. Yeah. Uh, because school's not for everybody. No. I, I, I know that, for, for young people. You get pregnant, have a baby, and you just think, oh, I'm not saying you took a step back by having a baby, but it sort of slows you down a little bit in, Absolutely. in, in, in what you want to do. How do you overcome that? Well, I had my little girl then, and I knew I had to make changes for her because I didn't want her to go through the same thing that I'd gone through, and I wanted her to have a better life than I ha I've ever had. Okay. So she was the drive there for me, and... I did it. I got up every day. I went to work. I knocked on doors to try and get employment. And it's so difficult having no qualifications and no yeah. experience at that point for people to give you an opportunity. Yeah, I think sometimes we are... Um, we like products of where we were born. You know, for example, I'm, I was born in Nottinghamshire. Raised in Nottinghamshire, I was a coal miner for, for many years. If you, do, you know, people in Sheffield have become steel workers. People in, in Grimsby have become um, fishermen. And in Liverpool, it dock it docks. But... Liverpool had a tough time in the 80s and 90s and, and noughties, I think, when you were probably trying to earn your co coin. So it's actually more difficult in... And no disrespect to Liverpool, but more difficult in a place like Liverpool yeah. to, to do what you've done. It is. It was more difficult because, as well, being five foot, don't be... Don't five be, foot? Yeah. Um, well, I'm six foot two. There you go, Leia. 
There you well, go. Well, to stand on a barrel today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being five foot, yeah. Yeah, being five foot and having such a broad Scouse accent as well, nobody really took me serious. And I'm not educated, like, I don't know big, massive words and... I don't really, you know, I know how to make money. I know how to do business. So it was difficult for me. And a guy came up from London and he was starting the Camden of the North. OK. And I went to him for a job and he told me to F off. And I just kept going back and going back. And in the end, he said to me, because he was being a smart aleck, he said, you can be an elf in the grotto. Bear in mind, this was in the docks of Liverpool, absolutely bitterly cold in December. And I was like, OK, I'll do it. So off I went and got dressed up as an elf. And in the end, he said, you know what, I'll give you the job. I ended up working as a secretary, worked my way up to be a PA. And then I ended up running the site. And after three years, I took control of the site. Mm, so um, that, that'll teach him, won't it? It uh, certainly it's, will. It's what's certainly it like, dressed as an elf? Awful. Awful. But then, so Stanley Dock was the biggest Sunday market in the Northwest. I attracted Hollywood blockbuster films to be made there, like Guy Ritchie, Sherlock Holmes, Captain America. Used it for lots of um, BBC, ITV dramas, nightclubs. So I utilised the space. So there will be some young people out there looking at this, or well, I hope they are, um, looking at you, Kate, and thinking, I want to do what she's done. Any advice? Just be confident in yourself. Get up every yeah, day. Yeah, but that's easy for you to say, because you're a confident person. How do you, I, I just, sometimes people got to work at that to be confident. Yeah, you do, but you have to tell yourself you have to have a positive, positive mindset as well. And don't let circumstances or other people influence you. Mm. Every single person is made up of the same yeah. thing. We've all got it inside us. It's just nurturing it and getting it out. Be confident in yeah. yourself. I get up every day and I've got no problem with talking to myself in the mirror and saying, go on, girl, you're going to have the best day ever. You have to make sure... People are scared of failure as well. And that's it. What about rejection? Because you, uh, you strike me as a sort of person that just gets yourself up, dusts himself down and just cracks on with it. But that... Rejection comes all through your life, but you've got to think to yourself, you know what, I don't care. I will do it again and I will prove you wrong. Use that rejection as drive and ambition to get where you want to be. Mm. Well, you can dress as an elf. I could never get away with that. I've got a bigger challenge for you now, Kate. On the pool, pipe pop. You've got 30 seconds to put... I think it's that one there, darling. Doll, I own pups. OK, oh, well, I'm well, okay, well, this. No, no, I've okay. got an unfair advantage. OK, let's have a look, then. She owns pups. Yeah. And fast cars. Fast cars. Yeah. Unlike your bling. That's a big blingy, that ring. I know. Oh, let's just put a little bit of shake. And what we're going to do as well in a moment is get back the um, the, the left in the corner, Andy McDonald. Can somebody wake him up, please? There you go, me yep. darling. The yep. perfect pint. Andy McDonald, come back in the room, please. Right, so Kate, I get, can I get off wanna, my box you, now? Yeah, get off your soapbox. <laughs> and uh, if you want to pull a pint there, my friend. Are we off, pal? No, it's not off. Typical socialist, are you? Oh, it's it's get on with it. Christ. And then we're going to get Chloe Dobbs back. Um, and he's, he's got a good wrist action there, Kate, oh, hasn't yeah, he? Oh, he yeah, he has, yeah. He's uh, done this before, haven't he? Before, yeah. It's probably the hardest work he's ever done. <laughs> he's, he's, uh, <laughs> yeah, he's a socialist, look. Um, I like your watch as well, Andy. That's very retro. Oh, Casio, that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Casio, digital watch. I had one of those. And Chloe? Do you want to come back in? No. no. It's your turn. Let me get your pint pot. I have to say, Kate's one is going to be hard to compete with. Well, I think so. There you are, darling. I've done this for about five years. Let's, uh, let's have a look. Let's have a clown. So obviously, uh, you'd have been a student, and all students work behind bars, don't they, at some stage? But yeah. you were never a student. A student of a life, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Common sense. Still am. I tell you what, it's going to be hard this week to... Uh... Oh, a reverse pull. Did you see that, Andy? Yeah. Oh, I did that, I know. Yeah, reverse pull. There you go, the film. <sighs> so, Kate, I want you to mark Chloe's point. Well, as a publican, I like this one because you've got a bit of a head, so you've saved a bit on the beer. Yeah, so what would you add to 10? I would give that, my darling, a 10 out of 10. Yay! Yeah. OK, Andy, which one's yours? One on, right. I'll give that four. And um, <laughs> that's your one in the middle, isn't it? No, that's not. Sorry, that's, that's, that's yours in the middle, Kate. Yeah. Andy, you got to judge Kate's point. So, so eight, eight out of 10, that. So I, don't, got... I don't like Ed and Milagre. The head was perfect when she did pull OK, so you've got, you've got... Um, Chloe's got 10 out of 10. Andy's got a miserable four. No bias scoring at no, all, Andy. It's awesome. been one of those shows. And I think Chloe's got an eight. Clearly the women are the best at anything, basically. Is that not sexist? 
Who yes, cares? who cares? Is that sexist? Is that sexist, Kate? It's all right to be no, sexist against true. white males, you know, I mean, in this day and age. I mean, well, to be fair, considering your performance on the last few parts, it probably is justified here. Right, OK. <laughs> I'm going to shut him up now. Here we go, here we Let's go. Have a look. I'm sick of him. <laughs> Watch this. Are you watching this? You can't see him. Viewers before. will remember uh, when Lee no. did this in, uh, in Ashfield, he did. Uh, it was and, hot foam. It and was. I'm going to do the Chloe. The Chloe good. technique, which is the reverse pull. I think, anyway. There you go. It's not, not full bad. to the top. Yep. Just full. And, um, you're giving me a discount for that, are you? Well, you're going to give me that for that one, Andy. <laughs> well, you, you've, not, you've not filled it up, so probably six out of ten. Six out of ten. Six six out out of ten. That's on the poll. <laughs> Thanks, guests. You've been brilliant. Nice to meet you, Kate. Lovely to meet you, Lee. Chloe. Lovely. And well, always a pleasure, pleasure. Massive thanks to all my guests on this week's Lee Anderson's Real World. More of the same next week at 7pm on GB News. But coming up next, we've got Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Mark, what's occurring? Brilliant stuff. Thank you, Lee. Well, a very busy Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan. Your weekend starts here. And as they block the Rwanda plan for the third time, is this proof that old people shouldn't be allowed to vote? We'll be talking about the House of Lords. Are attacks on Liz Truss at sexist? I think they are. I'm disgusted by the sneering commentators attacking our former Prime Minister. As they try to lure back young Brits, is the EU behaving like a crazy ex-girlfriend? They just won't take no for an answer, will they? And are the Tories sleazier than Hugh Hefner? Plus, is rainy Dubai the new Manchester? And is it wrong to speak ill of your exes? Also, why have the supermarket Iceland cancelled mums again? A busy show. See you after the news. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hi there, and welcome to the latest update from the Met Office for GB News. Sky is clearing overnight. Most places fine as we start the weekend with high pressure in charge. That high pressure moving in from the west. Still a bit of a chilly breeze from the north, but as high pressure moves in, skies are going to clear, winds are going to ease, and under lengthy clear skies and with light winds, temperatures will fall away. A few mist and fog patches possible for the likes of Northern Ireland and some frosty conditions as we begin the weekend. So gardeners beware. Temperatures in urban areas three to five Celsius, but as low as minus three for the likes of Northern Ireland, Northwest England and North Wales. Temperatures though through Saturday morning will quickly rise because of the widespread sunny skies and it stays sunny towards the south and the west for much of the afternoon. However, it tends to turn cloudier further north with some outbreaks of light rain moving into northern Scotland where it will be fairly chilly and we've still got that breeze down the North Sea coast making it feel on the cool side. Warm in the sunshine elsewhere and another sunny day to come for Northern Ireland, parts of southwest Scotland, West Wales and southwest England on Sunday. Bright skies also into the southeast. Elsewhere, increasingly low cloud and some patchy rain and drizzle for Northern England and eastern Scotland. Monday brings further cloudy skies for many with some patchy rain, but it stays relatively... Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Saturday, 10 till 12, we'll bring you all of the news that you need to know. We'll also remind you that there is so much to smile about. It's my favourite time of the week. I get to relax, enjoy some lighthearted stories and let Ellie teach me about fashion too. <laughs> That's Saturday Morning Live, every Saturday, 10 till 12. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. Thank you for joining us on GB News, Britain's news channel. From the world headquarters of GB News, this is Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan. The weekend starts here, so bring your own drinks. The admission is free. On tonight's show, are the Tories sleazier than Hugh Hefner? Is rainy Dubai the new Manchester? Are attacks on Liz Truss sexist as the dusty House of Lords block the Rwanda plan for the third time? Is this proof that old people shouldn't be allowed to vote? I'm going to get in so much trouble tonight to fall out over those topics and many more. My Friday A-team, always on the verge of cancellation, fearless comedian Sajila Kershi, football legend and usually the first to be red-carded Tony Cotty, and TV news royalty, the most trusted man in the building right now. That is a low bar, Nicholas Owen. <laughs> So my Friday feeling monologue is coming. You won't want to miss it. I'm not pulling my punches. But first, the news headlines and a very old friend of mine, Sophia Wensler. Thanks, Mark. Good evening. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB newsroom. Your top story this hour, a man has set himself on fire outside the courthouse in New York, where former US President Donald Trump's hush money trial is underway. The man was in the designated protest area outside the Manhattan Criminal Court. The person received medical attention and was taken from the area. The circumstances are still unclear and we will bring you more as we get